Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Sometimes it takes going online to figure out who you are in the real world. That's what Kale Oskari Matilla writes about in his piece, Catfishing Strangers to Find Myself. Corey Michael Smith performed the piece at our recent live show at the Provincetown Film Festival. He stars in the new film 1985 and plays the Riddler in the Fox show Gotham. More than a decade ago, when I was growing up in Finland, my model of an attractive woman was Pamela Anderson from Baywatch. She was my father's favorite. Whenever the boys at school asked me who I Googled when my parents weren't home, I said, Pamela, and the name was greeted with a unanimous nodding of heads. I didn't care much for her nude shots, but I liked that she was of Finnish heritage. My non-sexual feelings for Pamela were just one of the things that made me an outcast. Another was that I preferred computers to people. And so, as a child who loved playing board games, I soon discovered I could play them online with strangers on a Finnish gaming website. To access the site, you typed in your username in the blank field, waited for a slot to open, and then found yourself in the main chat room where you could challenge people to a round of blackjack, keno, or billiards. Except it seemed no one else was there to play those games seriously. The screen was a constant stream of dirty messages. I realized no one wanted to message with a boy in his early adolescence, but many were clamoring to chat with an attractive woman. And that's where Pamela came in. (laughs) To interest fellow gamers, I needed to become a woman. Using Pamela's age and some of her defining features to create my new persona, I logged into the chat room as Charlotta Double D 35. (laughs) Then the messages came pouring in. I accepted an invitation to play billiards from Jarko25. A screen popped up, and we were escorted into a private room where a question from him appeared in the message box. Are you feeling frisky? (laughs) Why do you ask? I typed. Is it tight? He asked. I didn't entirely understand what he meant, but I knew it was dirty. I waited a moment and then wrote, yes. Nice. He replied, age? 35, I wrote, but I love younger men. That's hot. What do you look like? I quickly Googled Pamela plus Anderson and described what I saw in the search results. 179 centimeters, blonde. I like to wear heels and tight dresses. Mm. Do you have big breasts? Yes. D cups? Yes. I was determined to give him everything he wanted. What sort of men do you like? He asked. Thinking of James Bond movies, I said, someone like Pierce Brosnan. Someone who takes charge. Someone stylish. I can definitely take charge, he said. I took a sip of my Kool-Aid. <laughs> Six-pack? I asked. Now was the time for me to be demanding, otherwise it wouldn't seem real. Having a six-pack was a thing I had heard was desirable. Not really, he said. But I have one in the fridge. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> Maybe he was a nice guy. What followed was my first ever cybersex session, with him typing suggestive remarks and me typing, "Mm," which seemed to work for him. (laughs) 
My masquerade went on for months. I became a master of giving men what they wanted. The sheer number of interested men meant I could be picky, too. I wanted a conventionally handsome and sexy young man. And since I was a woman of such high caliber, I didn't think it was too much to ask. <laughs> I tailored my story to suit the other participants' interests. I was married with two children. I had a rich husband who couldn't satisfy me sexually. We lived in an enormous glass house with a private beach in one of Helsinki's most exclusive suburbs. And since I was a bored, lonely housewife, I always needed someone to come over and take care of things. I found amateur photos of naked women online to send to the men and patched up whatever incongruities emerged. The picture doesn't have a face because I don't want my husband to find out I've been posting my photos online. Or... I never give my number to strangers until I've gotten to know them well enough. The backstory also allowed me to an escape in case my parents got home. My husband just walked in, so I have to go now, I would say. Can't wait to talk to you soon. I liked this online seduction much more than I imagined I would. I told myself it was the danger of getting caught, of fooling the men, of breaking rules. Whatever the case, I'd become addicted. Every day after school, I would continue my quest for the perfect man. That's when I came across UC. He described himself as a man who was 23, loved the gym, and had a six-pack. He played ice hockey and basketball, masculine sports I'd always wanted to be good at. But he was emotive, too. He sent me messages such as, you sound like an incredible woman, and I can sense such warmth in these messages of yours. He asked me the usual questions. What are you wearing? Where do you like to do it? How do you like it? I provided my usual answers. I was wearing nothing. I just got out of the shower and like to cool my body naturally. I like doing it on every surface of the house and particularly in public places. All the yoga I did made me incredibly flexible and I loved being lifted up and twisted into adventurous sexual positions. But then he began to talk about what he hoped to find on the site. Namely, a relationship that was real and meaningful. I agreed I was tired of sleeping around, too. Usually I blocked a man once he began to insist on meeting in person, but UC was patient and sweet. I wanted to continue talking to him. We logged in at the same time, day after day. I adjusted the schedule around my school days by saying, I'll need to drop the kids off first, so I won't be home until 3 p.m. tomorrow. He worked night shifts as a security guard, so he was always online when I needed him to be. After a few weeks, he said, Can we meet already? Please, Charlotta. <laughs> he told me that he was tired of chatting and that if I didn't say yes, he wouldn't believe I was a real person. What we had was real to me, and I didn't want to disappoint him, so I agreed. We set a date for 7 p.m. a week later. We agreed to meet on a street corner in the center of Helsinki, mere blocks from where I lived. I hoped we would recognize each other simply because we had been talking for so long and had such a strong connection. As the days passed, however, the impossibility of it began to dawn on me. Even if I were to go meet him and get past the initial explanations, I could never become what he imagined me to be. And something else dawned on me as well. I was starting to realize I might be gay, and that's why I was different from everyone else. At 7 p.m. that evening, my mother put sausages and french fries on the table for dinner. 
I sat in silence, answering her questions with an absent-minded yes or no. Looking at the clock, it hit me. UC was now standing out in the cold night, alone. I wondered how long he would wait. 20 minutes? 30? A full hour? Would he camp out at a nearby cafe while wistfully looking out of the window, searching the passing crowd for Charlotta's face? I imagined him sitting on the bus on his way home to the suburbs, hoping there'd been a mix-up. I'd either forgotten the day or mistaken the time. I imagined him logging on to the chat room and scanning the list for my username, only to come up empty. I'd blocked him to make sure I didn't have to read through any excruciating messages. A couple of hours after dinner, my mother came to knock on my door to tell me it was bedtime. As I lay alone in the dark, I felt the same loneliness UC must have been feeling. I wish there had been a way for me to tell him what his online companionship meant to me. That he had made it possible for me to be myself in a strictly gendered world of Pamela Anderson's and James Bond's. That he had helped me believe I was funny, interesting, and worth talking to. That he had, if only by his presence, made it possible for me to begin to process my sexuality. By pretending to be someone I was not, I had shown him my true self one I had been too afraid to reveal to anyone else. And ultimately, I was able to embrace that true self, an acceptance that would allow me, years later, as an adult in New York City, to find real love as a real person. Smith, everybody. That was phenomenal, Reed. Thank you. Um, yeah, people who listen to the podcast regularly would maybe actually maybe we you don't know this. Um, we send lots of different essays to yeah. readers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to see sort of what works for them and what fits. And so I was just wondering, why did you choose this one to read tonight? Uh. Well, when, when thinking about coming to Provincetown Film Festival, I'm here representing a film I made called 1985, which is, thank, thank you for those of you that saw it. Uh, for those of you that did see it, um, I wanted to do something with some humor so you weren't concerned about my mental health. Uh, so that was part of it. I really wanted to bring some humor. And also, I've been to Provincetown a number of times, and I love this place, and I love the energy here. And it was a live performance. And I read this, and I just thought, it, uh, you know, it's... It's quirky and it's charming and I think it's really endearing and funny and very honest and a little raunchy and I think that's Provincetown. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Corey Michael yeah. Smith. Thank you. We'll catch up with author Kala Oscari Matilla in a minute. When we talked to Kala, he took us back to that night he stood up UC. I was feeling sad and guilty, and I could not fall asleep. So it was like probably like 1 a.m. I tiptoed to my parents' bedroom, and I was just standing there sort of looking at them asleep. And I was like, is this significant enough? Am I really going to tell them? And so I woke up my mom and my dad, and, you know, I just started crying. And I, I said... Mom, I, uh, I met this really great person online, but I let them down. So, of course, she was puzzled and she asked, you know, who, who was it? And I said, this guy that I really liked. And then my parents started to feel uneasy, which was understandable because they thought, you know, maybe this is a pedophile. 
Um, maybe this is someone trying to lure me into something dangerous. And my mom was like, what was he trying to do to you? And I said, you know, it's not like that. He's a really, really great person. And I really felt for him. Kala's mother made him promise that he would stop going on that website, and he did. He stopped impersonating women online, and he never interacted with UC again. But it wasn't the last time he created an online persona that didn't exactly match reality. Just a few years later, he started using one of the earliest gay dating websites, gay.com. You know, I created a profile where my location was New York City, and my uh, username was like, Nordic boy 18, even though I was like 15, 16. And of course, I created a backstory like I was a student at NYU and I lived on campus. But this time what was different was, you know, I was sending my own photos because I sort of wanted to know whether I was desirable. And sort of a similar thing happened on gay.com. Like I got to talking to this one guy for a really long time. I think he was in his late 30s. And, you know, obviously, like, it had a similar ending to the catfishing episode that I describe in the Modern Love piece, except, you know, this time I came clean to him and I said, you know, I'm still in Finland, but I'm going to move to New York in two years. Um, Let's stay in touch. And he was sad and angry, but we sort of talked it through. But after that confrontation, like, I didn't want to do that anymore, so it it was no longer a part of my life after that. We also asked Kala about the relationship that he writes about at the end of his modern love essay, the one that he called Real Love. He says that relationship ended. Shortly after I arrived in New York, he left me. And it was this really strange feeling of like, you know, reaching this dream of moving to New York and really feeling like the world was open and any anything was possible, but at the same time going through this incredible heartbreak. And I think that really sort of describes life as I see it. It's the good and the bad. And I just, I try and embrace all of that. Kala says that having his modern love piece out in the world has led to some awkward first dates. But I mean, then there are also people who find it really funny, who find it wonderful. So it's become this litmus test for my dating life. If people are uncomfortable with that piece, then they're probably uncomfortable with who I am as a real person. Kala Oskari Matilla. He's a writer living in New York City and working on a book about masculinity. We've got more after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times. Online relationships really get a bad rap these days, whether it's using an online dating app or some sort of CD chat room or whatever. Like it's it's all talked about as though um, it's it's detrimental to real relationships and it's overly self-protective and all in this negative light. But what I loved about this essay is how how even an unhealthy relationship can make you healthier in a way and how it can help you understand yourself He really learned about himself through the process, and that ultimately helped him find love and sort of become a full human being. Next week, Cameron Esposito. On the phone that stone gray April day, I told my parents in Boston that I was leaving college to walk 2,650 miles from Mexico Canada and be alone. They thought I must be unstable, not sane, but they felt my conviction and did not resist. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. 
It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, Caitlin O'Keefe, John Parati, and Amory Sievertson. Original scoring and live sound design by Matt Reed. Special thanks to Lisa Viola, Joanny Rivera, Julie Rocket, the whole team at the Provincetown Film Festival, and Scream Along with Billy. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Megan Chakrabarty. See you next week.